Praise God. Isn't God good? We want God to move, but when He does, we can't keep up. Because we think He's slower than us. God is never slow. In fact, we won't be able to keep up with what God is doing. Amen. You know, when I walked in, into the sanctuary, the fear of God was so strong. It's like the hand, there was a hand that was pressing on my shoulder, kneel. And when I did, a ball of fire came and surrounded me and surrounded my neck. A burning ball of fire. I knew, I know that God is with us. Amen. The Holy Spirit with us. And we are so afraid to say God. We want to say the Holy Spirit only. But the Lord wants to manifest the way He wants to manifest. Amen. 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 Tell your neighbor, get used to the Holy Spirit. Because people find it strange that God showed up in the church. What? He came? He's supposed to be there. He will be there whether there are any people in the church or not. Do you know that? Because that's His church. His place. His fire dwells in His sanctuary. In the Old Testament... Whether the high priest or the priests, though they have to go every day and mend to the oil and the weeks and all of that they have to keep up. The high priest only goes once. Yet the Bible says his presence is in sight. He's dwelling in whether people go in or not. Amen. Amen. Do you think when you leave the house that God is still watching over your house? Why is that it applies to the church, uh, house and not the church? When people are not there, he's still watching. We are not used to, we are not accustomed to such omnipresence of God, you see. Amen. And he's here with us. Amen? Amen. And it's more scarier when he's here. <laughs> because then he's, he's got something to say about that, isn't it? I want to encourage all of us, we are... The conference is coming, and uh, the youth is, the $50 is a special for our church youth only. For those from outside that are coming, it's going to be $69. That will be a difference of 10 and then we are working things out. And so please pray as we are trying to uh, work many things out today. we also been busy this um, morning and afternoon talking with the techie guys, how to bring it into Zoom internationally. It's uh, quite a big uh, technical jargons, you know, when you're sitting down with all these guys and talk. But God will do something for us. Amen. 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 We have to believe. Don't, we have to receive small-mindedness. Okay, one amen. Thank you. Amen. Anybody? Want, ah, two. Wow, it's two. We have to receive small-mindedness. Amen. Oh, amen. To think big is something, but to keep resisting small-mindedness is important. If not, the small-mindedness will bring us back into the hole. You see. It will keep us small. And there's nothing wrong in being small, but let's remain small in Christ and do big things for Christ. Jesus said, let me decrease. Let him. Oh, you see, if you don't understand the, the exchange, that being decreased by itself means nothing. The exchange was, I must increase so that he might increase in me. So there was that divine exchange. And we must get used to and submit to that divine exchange. If not, decreasing inside and becoming smaller by yourself means isolation and depression. It means nothing. It means you're an isolated person. You just have low self-esteem. But when I decrease and Christ increases in me, it becomes a divine intention which God approves and seals it, then life by itself takes a meaning in our lives. Amen. 
And sometimes perhaps we have never seen that kind of a church. Maybe can God use that kind of church? Is there such a church? Because so many people are telling me the same thing. We have been in the ministry for so many years. We have been around for 40 years. We have never seen this. We have never seen that. Then let us pray God before I die. Help me to see what the book of Acts is all about. Let it be at least once. Let it see. I don't want to die without seeing who you are and what you can do. When one person commits themselves to God. Remember the famous saying, God, the world is waiting to see a man who is totally surrendered to God and what God will use out of him. One statement like that brought giants of faith. It brought Jordan Wesley up. It brought Reynard Bonke up. Many, just on that one statement, the world is just yet to see. What if it's a whole church? We have not seen it before. But does it mean we always must remain that way? But we can change it. Some of us are not used to deep penetrative worship. We are used to once in a while the worship will be good. Once in a while the Holy Spirit will stumble upon the service. But what if it's an every day, every moment encounter with God? What if once in a while, oh, exceptionally the sermon was good. What if it's an everyday moment where the Lord shows up and speaks and layer by layer he's staring our hearts up with his word. Page by page where the word becomes afresh and anew. Amen. Let's get used to him. Not used to ourselves, but used to him. And I pray that God will inspire and pour a fresh oil and his spirit, not upon us only, but upon all the churches that are around here. And we have, must become an open portal. It must become our prayer. From the day we came till today, we are praying only the same thing, that God is not just about us. Because if it's about us, then you want to become famous, you see. If it's about us, then you want everybody to flock to see something is going on. But when they come, nothing is going on. It's the same ordinary people worshipping God in an intensive way. They are looking for some acts, but what they are seeing is lives changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the whole process of God is not in that two hours that we are with him. It what happens when we step out of this place. With our hearts and our attitudes and our actions bear the change that God is bringing within our environment. Amen. I want to draw your attention to the book of Acts. And we are talking about the power of prayer. And as I said that uh, if you have been a student of prayer, if you, are, if you are in the Lord for the last at least 30 years, you have read pretty much good books on prayer over and over again. And we have an idea of what prayer is all about. But it is not the treatise or it is not about the theoretical foundation, even though it is important, but it's the experimental experience that we need to have. The depth of how much God can bring. Amen. Some are called to prayer. Some are called to prayer. I remember David Livingstone when he went to South Africa to do ministry. And he wrote an appeal to his missionary organization. Send as many people as you could because now is the open door to change South Africa. And a group of missionaries wrote back we want to come, but these are all the hurdles and they wrote everything that is negative. Don't have electricity and don't have uh, water and don't have this and don't have that and don't have this. And would you be able to get us all these things? Because we want to come in with, with our families and serve together. And then he wrote back, please don't even come. If you are coming for God, come expecting nothing. 
that God will use us for his glory. Amen. Many times we do say, God is all that I need. But is it true? If he would test our hearts, is that all that I need? And so sometimes God allows us to go through. And so the Lord has shown us, and, and you know the word of prophecy that came through this year, that we need to have, a, this is a very critical year uh, for America as well as the nations of the world. And uh, some of the prophecies that a, a pastor just wrote to me, a text, last Wednesday, while the service was going on, I was uh, speaking to another church in Tennessee uh, online. And the Lord gave me different words of prophecy for different people. And I was speaking through, and the Lord said, it's just a few days now, three of the, all the prophecies have already come to pass, and the church is excited. Because God does things. Are you with me? And I want to get encouraged because the Lord is doing something amongst us. And so this is a critical year. Every time, listen, every time God wants to do something in your life, you got to start and finish with prayer. And that is why we don't see the continual or the continuity in God in our lives because somewhere along the line we stop. Everything starts and finishes with God. Everything starts and finishes in prayer. It is a law of heaven. It is a law of God. When God is involved, prayer becomes the air that you are breathing. It becomes part and puzzle. It cannot be a strange thing that people should pray. Have you ever heard when people say, for example, give an example for you to think about. Suddenly you have a friend in church. Say Martha. I don't think so there's any Martha in our, in our service. Martha, let's go, for, uh, 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 let's go for a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Oh, no, I, I got to go back to pray. Okay, maybe. Yeah, it's Tuesday. Thursday, Martha, are you free for? No, I, I'm praying. Sunday, after service, Martha, let's go for lunch. No, 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 I need to go back and pray. So then it becomes your concern. You tell to your friend, I wonder what's going on with Martha because she's all the time praying. You say, I think she's going into some trouble, some emergency that we don't know about. Do you realize that when a person wants to be consistent in prayer, it has been associated if you have problems. It is no longer we think it's normal anymore. I know this lady, she's not that type. But if she's really praying, something must be going on wrong. And so the one who wants to pray and fast usually will end up lying. Are you hungry? No, I'm not hungry. Would you like to have lunch? No, I don't think so. Why don't you just simply say fast? I'm fasting. And people will let you, leave you alone, you know. If not, they will persuade you. Just have a drink, just have a snack, just have that, I just have this. How much of that Holy Spirit activity? So we want to place a foundation of prayer because anything that God wants to build in our lives, like a prophecy coming to pass, and if a big things that God wants to do, the foundation is always, it starts with prayer. We are waiting for the fulfillment of prophecy while God is waiting for his people to pray. Without prayer, there is no fulfillment of any prophecy. Are you waiting for? Are you listening? Oh, we are praying, God, that that man of God spoke. Then that is going to come to pass. We are waiting eagerly for prophecy to come to pass because someone who is very anointed said it, but God is looking whether you are kneeling down and you are praying for that prophecy to come to pass. Prophecies can be left on in the air because what you have not taken in, the birds of the air will come and pluck it out. Mark chapter 4 tells us that. And the only way to secure our destiny and our call and what God is about to do in our lives is to have a foundation of prayer. A foundation of prayer is like entering into a cave that you have all the secret and the treasuries of the Lord inside our lives. 
And the church, no matter how small we can be, but we must be deep in God. We can start small, but we cannot start shallow. Are you listening? Because people somehow relate, small means let's be shallow so that we can attract people more. Is that what we are all the time doing? Is that the goal of a church is to attract people? No, it's to attract Jesus. Is to have God involved because the Bible says when I am lifted up, I will draw all men. Drawing all men is God's work. And what he is supposed to do, I don't have to do it. My job is to honor him, to walk with him, to do evangelism. That's all I'm doing. I'm doing evangelism not to attract people to the church, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, that's a very weak amen. amen. Yes. You, you can have been convicted. We'll heat up the water there. Boom, we'll baptize you again. The fire will come back. Are you with me? Yes. That's not our job. You see, the moment attracting people becomes our job, then we must be so busy in theatrical acts of the church. The whole church looks like a theater. It's full of drama. It's full of actors. And they, fulfill, they will fulfill what Shakespeare said. <laughs> the world is full of actors. We will do the best song, the best thing, and the best to attract people to give a best picture of who the church is and what the church is. But is that what we want to do? Not exactly. It all could be true, but those things usually don't last. Because those are the cosmetic effects. But God wants to bring authenticity in our lives. He wants to bring the real deal. If you want to test a church, it's not what you see in the Sunday. You got to see them in the porch what they're doing. You got to see them outside what they're doing. You got to give them a call once in a while to see what they're doing. Bring someone for a cup of coffee and you see how they're talking. Are you with me? Because that's the church. On Sunday and all the days that we come together, we are in our best behavior. We can control ourselves for two hours. Speak the right thing. Do the Christian act. But when we step out, when our natural self comes back, then the question is, which is my natural self? So I pray that we will die to our natural and Lord, get, let God reign in our lives. Amen. So we want to investigate a little bit, talking about prayer. The church has an important influence in establishing a foundation of prayer in the life of the church, which is the people. That means the praying people makes a praying church. A praying church makes praying people, isn't it? That, that, then who is the church? If the people are not, that means a praying pulpit. When we teach prayer, when we impart prayer, when we leave an example of prayer, then that becomes contagious. It is impossible to have a prayerless pulpit and a praying church. It's impossible. It starts with the head, it finishes with the tail, or it starts with the tail and it finishes with the head. Whichever. We are one body in Christ Jesus. Amen. But what is prayer without the influence of the Holy Spirit? What is prayer without finding where God is doing and what he's doing. And so I want to bring your attention to Acts chapter 1. We want to investigate in the couple of weeks, as the Lord also told us that we need to have a school of prayer. And a lot of people were writing and asking, when will you do this? Will that be in the weekend? Can we drive from somewhere? We are living far apart and my commitment is only one line. My first commitment is to our flock. You can watch through the video, buy the USB or whatever not. That's our first commitment. Is prayer going to be so strange that what I don't know? Not necessarily. Whatever you already know is what we're going to talk about because it's in the Bible. But our experiences define us. Our experiences are different. The only thing different about talking about prayer is consistency. Many of the giants of prayer learn how to pray when they did not have 
the, ch- the modern challenges or distractions of the modern life. I remember when I was young, younger, I read John Wesley's biography, autobiography. It was that thick, thicker than the Bible, man, I tell you. And uh, he wakes up three in the morning to pray. He will bring his kerosene lamp out to the farm, barn, and he'll be there on his knees praying before God. And I remember a brother came and told me, I'm trying to wake up at three in the morning and pray. Nothing happens because I can't even wake up. So I told him, do you remember what time he goes to bed? He said, no. I said, seven in the evening. There were no electricity, no cable TV, no cell phones. Somebody say amen. Amen. No. Wife was there, but no Wi-Fi. Half of the evils comes because of Wi-Fi, man. Nothing was there. When it was dark, there is no electricity to keep you awake. Boom. They went to seek God. Today, the modern man has got a lot more distractions, but heaven's requirements have not changed. He gives you the choice to wake up. He gives you the choice to switch off. He gives you the choice to seek the Lord. Amen. So we want to investigate the Holy Spirit and prayer. You see, in the book of Acts, you take away prayer, the book of Acts, the church dies. You take away the Holy Spirit, it dies. In Acts chapter 1 verse 1, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have Listen carefully, I want you to listen carefully. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, the writer was Dr. Luke, who wrote the Luke's Gospel, and now he's writing about the book of Acts. In the Gospel of Luke, he wrote about all that Jesus had done. So it was Jesus and prayer. The word prayer appears more in the book of Acts than any other gospels put together. Now John is not a gospel by itself. It's a book. It doesn't come under the gospel description. It comes as a book. But even if you would put Matthew, Mark and John together, three, the word prayer is mentioned more in the gospel of Luke than any other three of these books. So is the book of Acts. Somehow, like a doctor with investigative analytical thinking, he wants to know the lifeline and the reason behind the power of the church. He investigated the reason behind the power of Jesus and he found it was prayer. So he paid attention to every time Jesus prayed. At all times Jesus prayed. And then now after investigating the gospel of Luke, about prayer and Jesus, now the gospel, the book of Acts. Here he found the Holy Spirit and prayer. Gives them the power to do what Jesus did before. And the shocking description of all of this, more than 60 over years have passed. Gospel of Luke was written 69 years after Jesus was crucified. The book of Acts was much more. Even though the documents were all put together by the time the whole book was ready, it was much more later. But you know what they found? The power was the same. They found the Holy Spirit was as the same. They could not find a difference between the disciples. In fact, the disciples were more anointed than before. The Holy Spirit took over the presence of Jesus because in John chapter 16, he said, the same kind. Another one will come. Another one will come. The Another comforter will come. The counselor will come. The teacher will come. He's another, but the another is of the same kind. That means he represents me. 
He will take whatever that I've said and will come into you. Amen. So whenever that people will say that the Holy Spirit is active in our life, how, how do you differentiate that? Because they are looking for the power of God. So rather than we introduce to anybody that the Holy Spirit is active, people who come to our church must see the Holy Spirit is working amongst us. Because the Holy Spirit is more than a shadow, is more than a fragrance, is more than a, just a light feeling, he's just more than a tear, he's the power and the presence of God. Even if you say, he's my shadow, even shadow can be seen. So where is the Holy Spirit? You see? He cannot be saying, we are just saying the Holy Spirit is there. Have you been in a service, have you been in a church where it's more, it's more cold than ice? Because the Holy Spirit is not there. And so we have to hold him closer. Worship him and honor him. Praise him. Humble our hearts before him. Honor the word. Because whenever Jesus is honored and lifted up through his word, the Holy Spirit is manifesting. That is why today, one of the things, listen my brothers and sisters, if all that is true that we can only preach for 20 minutes, and that's what the Holy Spirit wants to do, isn't it? If it's so little, and among the 20 minutes of preaching, sometimes people quote one or two scriptures, and all about is the La La Land stories. Keep you happy, keep you strong, be this and be that. All that is good. But everybody else is already doing the be good stories. But the church must be filled with the scriptures of Jesus. Amen. People who honor God. So now this guy... The Dr. Luke, God selected Dr. Luke for that reason. He said, until the day when he was taken up and you know the story. And now he's saying, when the Holy Spirit came, something happened. So let's investigate a, a little bit. The emphasis of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts cannot be denied. Every page, every chapter, everywhere you turn, the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit is mentioned everywhere. Now Paul takes a little bit of a center stage after the uh, uh, chapter 9 because he comes into the story. So the book of Acts is basically the stories of the disciples and whichever book which Paul wrote, the epistles that he wrote was the stories and the experiences of what is going on in the book of Acts. Are you with me? In fact, it will be very interesting if you will trace some of the problems that he was going through at different locations of Paul's ministry and the revelation he got at that point became the epistles that he wrote to those churches. So sometimes it is nice. You see, no revelation will come without some kind of a pressure that is taking place in your life. That is why sometimes pressures are good. When you are going through pressure, get on your knees, God will speak to you. But the thing is, we have forgotten how to get onto our knees. We got into Google. We find out for a solution instead of finding out for a revelation. God, what are you speaking to me? If you will just take a moment to allow God to speak. And then usually, through those circumstances of, of life, He reveals Himself to us. You see, God, there's no reason God is going to reveal Himself as a healer if you're not a sick, if you're not sick. There is no reason for God to manifest His abundance if you are not in need. There is no reason for God to show He's a compassionate God if you don't need His compassion. That is why the walk of God, the walk of a child of God with Jesus, is a life of discovery. Discovering Him at all the different moments of our life. And therefore, as a church, we must discover, because my brothers and sisters, it is not about having a great vision. It's about having God in the midst of that vision. People are coming for Jesus and they want to see Jesus in our service. They're not looking for us. They are not looking for great preaching. They are not looking for great worship. And that's what happens when you invite people. Oh, come into our church. That's a you know, great worship. It's not like their singers are so good. You can tune into the radio if you want great worship. Come to our church, the preaching is so good. You can tune in. Oh my goodness, the amount of preaching we have on the TV. Just have your credit card ready, man. Yeah. It always ends up with that. Nothing wrong, but the manner is being done. The manner in which it's being done. Do you understand what I'm saying? 
People give generously when their hearts are moved by the Holy Spirit. E.M. Bound says, "Is only God moves the heart of men. Remember George Muller. He prayed. He prayed when he had the orphanage. He prayed that God will provide milk for the children. He prayed that God will provide bread for the children. He prayed that God will provide apples for the children. And every morning there will be the bell that will be hit or ring. Somebody will pull the bell. He will open the door. There will be crates of milk from 10 children, 20, it became 90, it became 100. The bigger the need, the bigger God's miracle was. The prayer was the same. Trusting God in a God who provides. I pray in the name of Jesus that we will come to that dependency on God. Dependency on God is not based on our bank accounts. It is not based on how much the church, the, 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 we have money or how many people we have. This Bible says, blessed are those who are poor in the spirit. For theirs is what? Oh my God. You can have everything around us. We can be the most well supplied and blessed church. But there must be a spirit that is so poor before God that without you, all this means nothing. Amen? The depth that we want to have, the closeness, and I pray, it must all, we must all be on the same page. So if you extract the Holy Spirit's role from the book of Acts, it becomes a book of history. You take away the Holy Spirit from the apostles, they become just mere ordinary men. You cannot admire a man without admiring the God that is using man. But today the world is different. It spins off differently. You see, we admire the person that much more than admiring the God that is working through him. If God can use him, God, you can use him. Corey Ten Boom. I hope you know your, your history. The moment I say this kind of history, if you are shaking your head, you must be somewhere between 45 and above only. <laughs> because nobody introduces these books to our young children anymore. I like to introduce all these books and ask our youths to read mission biographies, heroes of missions. Amen? Corey Ten Boom. People ask, how, uh, you know, how uh, will you present yourself to God? She took an empty plastic bag. He said, I'm like this plastic bag. If the Lord doesn't put his hand into it, I'm just nothing. Story finishes there. Men and women were giants in God. What was the outcome? They had no interest in that. The hardest thing in life is to be full with Jesus, not what you do for God. Are you with me, my brothers and sisters? Book of Acts continue to tell us and help us to understand God uses everybody and anybody. He chooses anyone and everyone. But the Gospels were not like the George, Jesus only chose 12. But the book of Acts was different. Anyone and everyone. But somehow the focus point of was all the apostles and the people associated with Paul. There were others among them. They were not highlighted yet they continued doing their work. But I want to encourage you when the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives there will be some evidence that we can see. And I want to highlight those evidence as much as we can study together so that we can put our pulse like that. You know, very interesting when you do an a ECG, echogram. Huh? Everything is good, brother, but your heart is missing a bit. Well, it's just one bit, right? <laughs> huh? Hello? 
Have you ever worried about it's just one bit man right? what's wrong with that no it's one bit something is wrong that well all the other means how is it it's drumming well <laughs> just one bit why not ignore no 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 something is wrong but when it comes to the holy spirit how many bits are we missing and why nobody is worried about it if the holy spirit is working why am i so cold Why am I not repenting? Why am I not moved when God's word is being preached? Why am I not moved when the worship is rising before the presence of God? Why am I not moved to forgive? Why am I not moved to change? The pulse, is it right? And so the book of Acts becomes the pulse. When the Holy Spirit is active in the life of a child of God, there must be certain pulses which must be the same regardless of our culture, regardless of our geographic location that is why no matter where you go which country you go you can go to church and it's the same amen there was a documentary that was done in iceland he talking about iceland you know the number of social problems they have number 1 is drinking alcoholism number 2 is murder Number three, you got to talk about affairs and adulteries. It all happens in Iceland. They have fishing communities and they have churches. They, all these men and women begin to gather and pray. They don't have the best preachers. They don't have the best sound system. The, the who's who of Christian world and church community have never visited them because you may or may not get any money, brother, but you may get fishes. it is just too far to have a great meeting with thousands of people gathered there could be 50 or 70 in the church but when they gathered to pray i saw the video man i tell you even now in speaking oh when they gathered and prayed a rushing mighty wind out of nowhere was recorded in that video <laughs> with the sound i'm going to search all these and put up so that you will get to be encouraged and a spirit of prayer came upon that town a spirit of repentance came upon that town people started repenting husbands started changing confessing and husbands and wives were healed by the presence of god alcoholism was being delivered churches were filled with knees before the presence of god so you know what he tells me people want to, people will come to church if god is there when god is not there don't force people to come don't force our children to come getting god inside the church is our first job then our youths will come our sons and daughters will come something is there in that church you know what that something is god if we force our children without god we are just duplicating religiosity for the sake of being a christian come but when god is there he will draw our children to god so let's throw ourselves like logs into the fire because when there are enough logs when the fire is big enough hearts which are cold will come to that fire In Acts chapter 2 verse 38 tells us of the first effect when the holy spirit is there now i'm not talking about the the effect of speaking in tongues we'll talk about that in later sessions but the first one that i want to tackle in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 how many of you are blessed already Amen. i've not started yet first point okay all that are introduction <laughs> to what the holy spirit is doing Ex chapter 2 verse 38 It says and Peter said to them Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off everyone 
whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So the first effect of the Holy Spirit when he's amongst us, the first pulse, when he touch, is a repentant heart. Now repentance is not just a one-time deal. It is not just to accept Christ and it's gone. It is there. And that is why the world takes advantage of children of God because we are the first one to say sorry. We are the first one to admit when something is wrong. We are the first one to acknowledge, yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Because you're all the time feeling the pulse that you don't want to lose the touch of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? And that is why time to time, intermittently, we say, God, I can't feel you. Is there everything? God, I'm sorry if I've done something. You're watching our conversation. You're watching our attitudes. The Bible speaks of having a repentant heart before God. A heart that welcomes the presence of God. A heart that is quick to repent when it needs to. A heart that is mindful of its speeches and its thoughts. Because God watches over the motives of our hearts. Because you cannot be different outside and suddenly pretend to be so humble inside. Because God judges you not in who you are inside there, but who you are outside. That file goes inside and he judges you. Do you realize when you are in the presence of God and you are praying, the Holy Spirit is convicting, not because you didn't pray, or last week you said you will fast, and how come you didn't fast? Or your mind goes, oh, remember January, you forgot to give your sights. Remember that chapter you said you read? Most of the dealings would have been with, you did not forgive. You did not show love. You had pride. You're supposed to help and he just walked away. You know you're not supposed to cut off when you were driving, but you just did it anyway and you pretend that you didn't. And those kind of attitude changes. And you wonder why is God, instead of checking me out in who I am in front of me, is checking me out in who I was outside. Most often, those are the garbage that we bring along he reminds you of a secret thought and a secret word that was said. And then you saw, well, no one was watching, but he did. Yeah. And so the first act, whenever the Holy Spirit is at work in our life, it has to do with repentance. It has to do with a repentant heart. When the Holy Spirit is active, and that is why when worship comes... Immediately tears streaks down and he reminds us of things there because the Holy Spirit doesn't want to see any form of hindrances when he's about to take you over. He deals with the hindrances. It could be an area of forgiveness. It could be an area of didn't forget to do something. And I, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters and uh, people of God, the Holy Spirit was more of a secretary to me. And no, I'm saying it in polite sense and a very humble sense because I really don't know what else to, how else to say. It. Because if he did not remind me to do things, I wouldn't have done what I've done for God all my years of life. He will tell me, now do this. Now do that. Now write the book. Now go back to your office and do this. And because sometimes I can be forgetful. Sometimes you are overwhelmed by other things and you forget about the things you're supposed to be doing. Remember you said you're supposed to send a check to someone? Get it done. Let me tell you about this tithing, uh, uh, interesting testimony. Those times where I would have hardly any money because I was living as an itinerant for 17 years. Now, I'm, when I say hardly any money, I'm not putting any smoke on God's face. He provided well, but the needs were equal to his providence. <laughs> The children, I tell you, if nobody sucks your money out, the children will. <laughs> Man, they drink, they, they drink milk. Oh my goodness, yeah. The only thing I should have done is to buy a cow and put it in the house. And the more they drink, the more pampers you must buy. 
And that also money. <laughs> and the ministry needs. The books that I was writing. And in the midst of it, the people will come and ask you money as well. And I give them generously because I know how to pray. They don't know how to pray. And I was in a church. The church that I was attending with my family, whenever I'm not traveling out, they were having a building fund. And that's a million dollar church, you know. They were having a building project. And the Lord said, would you commit $100 a month for that building project? That is different from your tithe. So I said, God, well, I will. So I committed for the whole year, $100 for the building project, you know. For six months, I was able to do it. For the next six months, I was traveling so much. And whenever the building project was coming along, I was not there to give. And I completely forgot about it. I gave my tithes, but forgot about the building project. And the month of uh, uh, January, uh, November was finishing. December started. And I knelt down to fast and pray just to keep uh, my heart in checked before God because end of the year fasting was coming. So I wanted to do my housekeeping early. And I was checking God. Lord, have ever, is everything okay? Is there any outstanding account? I was praising God. And all that is good. And then he came. Um, do you remember? For six months you have not given the building pledge that you said you would give. Oh, what? How can it be six months? While I was praying, I quickly ran to the checkbook and I was checking. Oh yeah, six months. The Holy Spirit is very accurate. You know that, right? Eh? <laughs> oh man, I opened my past account book. Account book. The balance money was $600. And the check that I'm supposed to write was $600. But the problem is, Christmas was coming. I need to buy gifts for the children. Buy school books for their new year. School uniform. And Christmas is a time when itinerants are not invited to preach because the local pastors will do their Christmas deal. So they basically will be home. And I say, God, you know all this, right? Now, I am telling you more than what I told God. But these are all the concerns. Not that he doesn't know. But the Lord said, you just write the check and be obedient. Yes, sir. Shh. Went to the church, dropped the $600, came out. And we had no, and, and then, you know, children are so excited about Christmas. I remember my daughter was still very young when she came. Daddy, what's happening for Christmas? Well, Christmas will come not to worry about it. Jesus said not to worry. So I just told him, because that's my faith. Two days before Christmas, a pastor friend of mine, he said, Stephen, I was praying and God said, write your check. I said, good, bro. It must be God. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to drop it in your mailer. You just take it and then you call me that you'll receive it. Sure. So that was in the first week of December. And then at 24th, he called me, 23rd, he put it on the mailbox. 24th, I went down to take, 25th is Christmas, still have no money to shop. And I said, this money came in, opened the check. I couldn't go up anymore. It was a check for $10,000. The Lord just told me to obey that 600. But I see, heaven operates in the principle of giving. Well, the 10,000 came and the 10,000 flew off because I had all the outstanding bills to pay. <laughs> but the promise that I made before God, Lord, as I kneel, as I cross the year, I don't want to be crossing a year with debts hugging on my back. I want to cross with your providence following me. If I want to owe someone, I want to owe you, oh God. Oh my goodness. Can God trust us? It's a choice that you must make. Repentance is an issue. Now, it can be offering. It can be forgiveness. It can be saying that you will do something for someone and you forgot about it. And that is why be careful with your speech. Don't say things you don't do. 
Don't flatter people. Flattery. God hates it. Read the Bible for heaven's sake, please. No, not for heaven's sake. Can you say that? For heaven's sake, please read your Bible. Don't flatter. If you're very used to flattery, you better watch out. As much as you flatter, do it. I'll be there. Make sure you're there. Don't say it. I am praying for you. It, don't say it like a Christian cliche. And you forget. If you don't mean it, don't say it. If you say it, do it. Got to zip your big mouth. Don't act Christian. Be one. Because God is watching. All these are going to put us away. And therefore, as a church, we must be what we say we would. And I want to draw you to the book of Acts because suddenly an anointing came when I was in the room in the office. And I shared with uh, Pastor Michael, you know, all of us have read the Bible enough times to know the sequence of situations. I want to leave this with point number one. It's already 8.30. I can't go any further. I don't know whether they had time frames uh, in the book of Acts or not, but uh, we have. I'm not saying that you want to go. I also want to go home, okay? So don't feel guilty. I'm not talking about you. <laughs> we all want to go home. <laughs> because I'm talking about the repentant heart. And the first challenge came in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 5. If I'm talking about the book of Acts and church, there are different areas we can tackle. But let's talk about the church and personal life. If the Holy Spirit is at work, if I'm putting the pulse, I want to know what is the first one. About a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. Now, I know sometimes I, I pronounce it differently. Remember, I can read the Bible in two different languages. My, my Tamil language, my native language, and I'm very fluent. Angeline is a teacher in that language. I'm very fluent in my language uh, and, and, uh, and uh, English, okay? In Singapore, English is our first language, right? But when I'm praying, I'm praying with God and I'm intervening, I'm praying in Tamil. Somehow the intensity is different. And uh, so whenever I read the Bible, because I'm fluent in both languages, the names and the pronunciation will interfere in my mind. So uh, Sapphira is a Tamil way of saying, but Sapphira is English way of saying. And what is the American way of saying? Safi, Sophie, huh? Sapphire, oh, Sapphire, okay. So a solar piece of property with his wife's what? Wife's knowledge. I mean, it should be, right? They sold a property. He kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, the Bible doesn't say the location where it was. I don't know whether it was a church or whether it was a house. We are not sure about that. And for the first time when I observed that, oh yeah, interesting. He didn't say it's a church. He didn't say it's a house fellowship, house fellowship. So we assume there must be somewhere the people were there, the apostles were there, and the people brought. Now why did they bring this? Chapter 4 tells us Barnabas also as, as an apostle he sold a field that belonged to him, verse 37 of chapter 4, and brought the money and laid in the apostles' feet. Now, Barnabas was an apostle. He was a leader. I don't know people think that when you give more money, you become a leader. Sometimes churches can be controlled by people with the money. And if you've got enough money, you become the leader. Because you are the first one to give. You are the first one to persuade. You are the first one to write the check and the first one to have influence in the church because influential people bring influential people. Big tickets writer have big tickets friends. Are you with me? Hey, nothing wrong with that, you know. I'm just saying this is how human social life is. And so when he saw the observation in chapter 4, if you have given the money, you become apostle. Maybe there was kind of a conflict inside the mind. Okay, let's sell our property. They didn't say to anybody, 
that they're going to hold back. It was their wife and him. They brought half of the proceed or less than half of whatever it was. The tithes, let's take 10% as the discussion. They brought a portion of that and gave it. They didn't say out of their mouths, they're going to give, for example, $10,000. Didn't say anything. They brought $5,000 and they gave. Just by giving, look at that and uh, verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to, give, to keep back for yourself a part of the proceeds of the land? Can you accept this? I didn't say I'm going to give 10,000. I just gave five. I didn't lie to the Holy Spirit. But there was some kind of a deceit that took place in the heart that the Lord saw that deceit. Even though out of the mouth they did not say it. When you say something, and when there is an ordinance of God, assuming this is a 10% thing that is going on, what you say out of your heart and your actions are... Take a note by God. And that's scary. You realize that when we are happy, we want to give. When we are sad, we don't want. <laughs> when we are happy and we have a lot more, we say, well, I am. But now, brother, we are going through challenges and maybe we should not. The Bible says, when you make a vow unto God, fulfill it. You may give $600, but your miracle, 10000 is bigger than what you are given. God doesn't give dollar for dollar. That's human. God give according to the measures of his glory. Amen. He say, oh, you may get a hundredfold. Man, hundredfold is a number. Why are you stuck with the number? The Bible says God will give you according to the riches of his glory. Eh? Sometimes you may not want to have a hundred dollars miracle. You just want to have a bottle of water. And so he gives you the bottle of water because you don't need the hundred dollars. Are you with me? And then he says, why is that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men but to God. But the problem in this passage is he did not even lie to any man. He didn't open his mouth. But God told Peter, you lied to God. See, we're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you, how much do you want the Holy Spirit to take you over? As many times as we open our mouth and say, God told me to do it. God told me to do it. I tell you what, you better beware of what you're talking before it becomes your last stop. Ananias and Sapphira for them that day, that journey to see the apostles was their last stop. Because people have forgotten the fear of God in the house. We carry our same heart and our same attitude and we carry ourselves bigger than what God is. God reminds us, this house belongs to me. You see? And we are frightened to stand before that almighty God. There was a man named Benson Ayodelsa, an apostle in Africa. He has already passed away. They have planted more than 5,000 churches. The first time when uh, uh, Oral Roberts saw this man and came to know about him, he invited him to Tulsa, Oklahoma to study under the Oral Roberts University. If you would study, you'll become an, a, a, a pastor who's educated, but within the first few months, of his study in America, he could not handle himself. The convenience of America, the lack of prayer of the people that surrounded him in the Bible school, he could not even handle. He cried and prayed and he prayed, pray, prayed for his uh, people. In fact, it's very difficult even to get his book. It's called Fire in My Bones. And he, within the few months, he told the chancellor, I want to go back. 
I couldn't stop praying for my people. I couldn't forget them. I want to go back. He went back, but while he was sitting on the plane and he was coming back, he said, God, what am I going to tell my wife and what am I going to tell the people who blessed me and sent me for the four years of Bible college, but I'm coming back within a few months. They will think I said an excuse. I didn't want to study. That was a cover. I couldn't handle the American education. He prayed and he cried. When the plane landed in the airport, do you remember those days where you have to actually, when you get on from the plane, the stack is, and you got to walk towards the terminal? When he was walking towards the terminal, the church members and his wife rushed towards him to give him a hug and welcome him. The moment they came, there was kind of a radius. Everybody who hit that radius, man, they fell by the power of the Holy Spirit. And before you know, the passengers fell by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as he walked forward, the radius went and everybody came closer to him, fell by the power of the Holy Spirit. God was showing to him, I am with you. He began to pray and he began to pray and he began to pray. And the Lord said to him that I wanted to start a school for the children. He went to apply. And they blocked because he was a Christian man. He had no money, but he knew how to pray. And he told the minister of education, God wants me to have the local, the local council, you know, to give an approval. And you know what the, uh, uh, the minister said? You can only do this over my dead body. Benson Ayodasa said, are you sure? <laughs> they say, yes, that's the only way this can be done because it cannot be done. He just said, let it be. The next morning, 8 o'clock, the file was approved by the new education minister because the old one died at 12 midnight over my dead body. People forget who they are standing against. People forget who they are speaking against. People forget the fear of God in their words that they speak. You know, people are so afraid to speak against a witch and a warlord. Oh, because whatever the fellow curse will come to pass. But they are not frightened to speak against a church. Because that God there, man, he's a Santa Claus who shows up on Christmas only. And their God is dead. People are not frightened to speak against the pastor, against the family, against the church against the things of the house of God. They're not frightened anymore. But speak about, oh, this road leads to the witch. You better don't go there. You go in, you'll be cursed. But people don't mind coming to the church, Kapakere, and curse the church and go out because God is not there. Are you listening? Oh my goodness. Is it true? It is time to bring back God in the land. Amen. It, is, it is time to bring back the Holy Spirit in what we are doing. It is time to have a heart of repentance and conviction because we love Jesus, not because it was a great message. But it's because God is active. The Bible says, even though it hurts you what you say, if you say it, do it, you will stand before the presence of the Almighty God. How many things we have said? My brothers and sisters, if you ask how to come into a position of favor before the presence of God, these are one of those things. That our hearts are active now. Having said all this, but when, when Ananias heard these words, he just fell down and breathed. His last stopped. Great fear came upon all the people who heard it. Okay, done. And very quickly they disposed the body. Now in America, in Singapore, you can't. You got to call the police. And then here comes the, after an interval of three hours, his wife came in. They already planned this time. Not knowing what has happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Oh. Listen, I want to give you a piece of advice. When you know there is a direct question, don't lie. Because God is at work. At least 
husband and wife, one must be telling the truth. If true are liars, you're done. <laughs> Here, the second one comes. Um, tell me how much. And then this is what, and Peter said, how much did you sell? And then she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? So the word that agreed together means they already did conspire in their home. This question will come and if they do ask this question, this is how you must answer. How many times we lie for not coming to the prayer meeting? Oh, my child is sick. And then by the time you finish and go back, your child becomes sick. You know why? Because out of your mouth, you just curse your own child. Got to be mindful what you say. If you can't come, you can't come. But don't say something wrong. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Oh, my car just broke down. You will have it tomorrow. It will break down. You know, being honest before God is much more cheaper than lying and seeing the consequences of it. Isn't it? Think about that because people have forgotten and the more we enthrone Jesus in the house of God, the more we walk with the fear of God. And I believe something has happened this afternoon when you guys were fasting and praying in this place. Something happened. Because God's presence and fire is not a result of unbelief. It is always a result of prayer and repentance. Because you didn't know what I'm going to preach. James don't know what I'm going to preach. You, you know, there are uh, churches that the worship will be aligned together with the preaching. So the pastor will say, this is what I'm going to preach. You'll select the songs. You know, James and I, we have been, what, serving together for 13 years, you know. I, I don't think so. Maybe two times I would have said, okay, this is what, can you sing that song? But he won't ask what's my sermon. He will never ask till today. It is not our practice. Because the Spirit of God is active in this guy, you see. So when he leads, that is the active work of the Holy Spirit that takes over. And then the message and the worship sounds the same. Because God is at work. But what if the worship, the message, and the people's heart are equally the same? And you know this is what's going to happen today. Because God is at work. The Bible says there was some kind of a conspiracy. How is that you agreed together to test the Holy Spirit? Behold the feet of those who have your husband are at the door. Now listen, if I would preach this way, the police will be stationed every Sunday outside. <laughs> every time in the power of the Holy Spirit fell onto the church, someone died on that Sunday. The pastor will be Arrested for voodoo and witchcraft. <laughs> Kenneth Hagin and Oral Roberts were arrested before when they were young in the healing evangelism for practicing medicine without a license. <laughs> they were not doctors. They were praying for healing, but they were arrested. <laughs> and our name of the church, if anybody dies during a service, will be published on Shelby Star. <laughs> this church is strange. People are dying. <laughs> Because we don't expect God to show up. My brothers and sisters, are you with me? So the first aspect is the power of repentance. It doesn't matter whether you are in church or whether you are outside because the location is not mentioned. It does not mention that they were during a prayer meeting the Holy Spirit spoke. No, this man walked towards the apostle and there the Holy Spirit spoke. That means you don't need a praying environment for the Holy Spirit to be at work. You probably could be walking into the church office and bang, the Spirit of God is active now. You see? It's a scary moment. You want more of God? That's all we need now. Nobody says, well, everybody fights against tithe. Why must I give tithe? Why must it be ten? It is the old covenant law. It is this law. Why do you draw the old covenant blessings then? Many of the Continuation of the New Testament blessings were based on the old. There is a flow on of God. All the abundance that you are looking for is found in the Old Testament. Every scripture, 
So there is a flow of God's commands. In the New Testament, your giving is not based on 10%. It could be 10 and whatever your heart is graciously telling you to give. Why is God's favor is coming upon us? Is because the 10% is your scythe. Then every other time you are giving as and when the Holy Spirit tells you to give, you are responding to it. Amen? Then God's favor is falling. Now God is not a lone shark, but there are people who can't give. God's love comes in other ways to tell them. It's not a desperate plan to lie about a tithe. Do you understand what I'm saying? But the point being is having a repentant heart. When you walk through the property of the church, when you walk through the campus of the church, when you walk through the aisles of the church, when you walk through the hallway of the church, wherever you whisper, the Lord is watching. The fear of the Lord must come and grip our soul. Imagine when we walk with that conviction. When our children are struggling through in their workplace, God will speak to you. When our children are struggling through in their bed and they are crying over something that happened in their school, the Holy Spirit will wake you up. Your daughter is troubled because your heart becomes soft before the Holy Spirit. Something could be happening right there in their workplace or their school or their driving moment and the Holy Spirit will tell you, pray now and intervene and the angels will be dispatched like 911. How is that? Because you are a praying person. My brothers and sisters, the spirit of prayer, you will become the invisible angel standing beside the mother who is screaming to give birth or she will die. You'll become the angel. Your prayer will assist her to give birth. You'll become the invisible angel behind, beside a homeless person about to die and someone is coming to give because you're interceding and God sends you on a mission. You'll become the invisible angel in someone who's earthquake and they are caught and the child is there screaming and crying for help. You'll become the invisible angel in your prayer and intercession when God sends you on a mission to that nation because God heard your prayer. The only way we will become missionaries before we can ever travel out to another nation is that when we are on a mission on our knees and only a praying church can take that assignment. I keep saying this again and I will say that again before we pray together. We pray for open heavens over this county. We pray open heavens over the churches who are gathered here. We pray for open heavens over every church that is struggling through. Some churches, the pastors are retiring and there's no one to take over. What if we pray and God will send a man who's anointed by God? It is possible when we pray. And that's our assignment. To become a prayer junction that God can do those things. But this evening I want to leave you with this thought of the act of repentance. It is not necessarily an outward manifestation that every altar call is full of repentance and crying and wallowing and weeping and tissue paper and slimy things. It's not about that. It's having a repentant heart. If not, it will become a religious experience. Brother, forgive me. Brother, sister, forgive me. Forgive me. It is a religious act. No. A repentant heart. So that we will measure what we say and be careful in what we do. And then God's favor will come. We will not be afraid to respond to God, nor to give to God, because God is at work. Can we all stand up together? I'm going to ask.